Open your Bibles this morning, please, to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 15, we'll be there in just a minute. This morning we turn our attention to the most monumental event in all of history. This is the event God foretold way back in the Garden of Eden when he said that the offspring of the woman would crush the serpent's head and that the serpent would strike his heel. This morning we will see the serpent strike his heel and next week we will see the Son of Man crush the serpent's head. I listen to a lot of books on tape when I'm working, when I'm driving, often a lot of fiction. I hate seeing the bad guys winning and innocent suffering as we wait for the tide to turn and the hero to come through. Even more so, I hate having to go through the crucifixion in order to get to Easter. But traveling through the crucifixion we must, for it is on the cross that Jesus made payment for your sins and mine. With that in mind, look with me please this morning at Mark chapter 15, and we'll begin in verse 1. Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. As soon as it was morning, having held a meeting with the elder scribes and the whole Sanhedrin, the chief priest tied Jesus up, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate questioned him again, Aren't you going to answer? Look how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus still not, did not answer, and so Pilate was amazed. At the festival, Pilate used to release for the people a prisoner whom they requested there was one named Barabbas, who was in prison with rebels who had committed murder during the rebellion. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them as was his custom. Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews for you? For he knew it was because of envy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he would release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate asked them again, Then what do you want? me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews. Again they shouted, Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them, and after having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led him away into the palace, that is the governor's residence, and called the whole company together. They dressed him in a purple robe, twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! They were hitting him on the head with a stick and spitting on him. Getting down on their knees, they were paying him homage. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple robe and put his clothes on him. They led him out to crucify him. They forced a man coming in from the country who was passing by to carry Jesus' cross. He was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his clothes, casting lots for them to decide what each would get. Now it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge written against him was the king of the Jews. They crucified two criminals with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha! The one who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. In the same way the chief priest would describe from mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, 
Eloi, Eloi, Lema Sadakthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, See, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, fixed it on a stick, offered him a drink, and said, Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women followed him and took care of him. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, as we study your word this morning, we ask for your help and your understanding. Help me to share your word. Um, help us to see how this greatest event in all of history impacts us. Our Holy Spirit, do work here this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Each of the Gospels records this monumental event. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all talk about the crucifixion of Jesus, for it is with the resurrection that lie at the core of Christianity. This is the part that sets us apart. In most religions, man has to do something to earn the favor of God. In some religions, man dies for God. In Christianity, the Son of God dies for man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. With the importance and the centrality of this event to the Christian faith, I struggle each year with how best to approach this event that split time and half between B.C. and A.D. This morning we're going to examine it primarily from the perspective of exactly what happened from the account of Mark. What are the facts in the case? I believe that the eyewitnesses of Jesus' execution by the Romans on the hill outside the city gates of Jerusalem could not possibly understand the significance of the event that took place that day. I do not believe it was immediately apparent to any of the bystanders that what was taking place in front of their very eyes was anything more than a matter of local geographical interest. They were watching the execution of a human being in the style of the Romans as they had done many times before. When the Romans used the execution form of crucifixion, they did not do it for Roman citizens, but only for slaves, for the vilest of criminals, and for captured prisoners of war. Yet what was going on in that place at that time was nothing less than the most monumentous cosmic event imaginable. It would not have been immediately apparent to the people who were there that they were witnessing an atonement by which the wrath and justice of God was being poured out upon a substitute. We had to wait for the instruction of the New Testament epistles, which by divine revelation gave us the theological significance and interpretation of this event. So this morning we look primarily at what happened that man could see. First we see that Jesus was scourged and mocked. Yesterday I read about a man who was on a waiting list to get into Harvard. He was a recent high school graduate and he was on a waiting list in case there were any openings at Harvard. With that in mind, he called Harvard University and asked to speak to the Dean of Admissions. The Dean of Admissions got on the phone and the young man said, I would very much like to attend Harvard you have me on a waiting list. Is there any way that you could go ahead and allow me to attend 
The dean said, I'm sorry there's no more openings, but I'm sure you'll enjoy your time at Yale. <laughs> Years later, the man ended up turning into a very successful businessman. As a matter of fact, he became a billionaire. And he had just written a check for $150 million to his alma mater, Yale University. He was telling a story to a friend of his. He said, really, the dean of admissions at Harvard is a friend of mine. Let me tell him what he missed out on. Two weeks later, the billionaire received a letter in the mail from the dean of admissions. He said, every time I see your name in the newspaper, I kick myself and think how I messed up. I wonder if Pilate had the same experience when it came to realize who Jesus was. I wonder if Pilate has a similar reaction each time he remembers that night that Jesus stood before him and he convicted and condemned an innocent man because he wanted to please some rabble rousers. Verse 15 records that Pilate wanting to gratify the crowd released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus to be scourged after and crucified. Criminals were often scourged before the crucifixion. Those who were scourged were tied to an upright post, their backs were bared, and a guard used a leather braided thong containing pieces of bone and metal to lash the prisoner until the skin came off his body and his bones and entrails were exposed. Many prisoners of Rome sentenced to execution by a cross never made it past the scourging. One of the reasons for the scourging was simply to humiliate the prisoner, but it also had the result of ensuring the crucifixion itself would not last too long. Jesus was scourged and then led away to the hall, which was probably a portion of the palace of Herod. We are told that they called together the whole garrison, which would have been one-tenth of a Roman legion, or to be specific, about 600 soldiers. The mockery that follows was not done by one or two or even a handful of soldiers, but rather the mockery that uh, befell Jesus that night was carried on by over 600 soldiers. As that night they had their fun with Jesus. We are told that the soldiers clothed Jesus with purple, which was an especially valuable dye at the time, reserved only for royalty. And they took a royal robe and they hung it upon Jesus and they began to bow down and pretend to worship him and hail him as he was a king. And they made a makeshift crown of thorns from a plant with exceedingly sharp spikes and put that on his head as a crown. And then they began to salute Jesus in a mocking way. Even as Caesar would be greeted by the words, Hail Caesar, August One, the soldiers saluted Jesus saying, Hail King of the Jews. And then they struck him on the head with a reed. As it drove the spikes even further into his scalp and they spat upon him. And imagine this was the one who created all of the world with a word. This is the one who calmed the storm. This is the one who raised the dead. This is the one who restored sight to the blind. This is the one who with a word could have called it all to an end. And he stood there and took it all for you and me. And once they had mocked him, they took the purple off him and they put his own clothes back on him and they led him away to crucify him. Mark tells us in verse 21 that they compelled a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. Simon of Cyrene just happened to be passing by and he was forced by the soldiers to carry the cross of Jesus because the scourging that Jesus had received was so terrible that he did not have the strength or the ability to carry his own cross. Normally the prisoner to be executed was compelled to carry his own cross to the place of execution 
And it was not the full cross as often we see depicted in many artist paintings and pictures, but it was simply the horizontal cross beam that after they got to the site of crucifixion would be attached to the vertical post that was already there. The point is that Jesus was already so weakened by the scourging that he could not carry even that post. And so they enlisted the aid of Simon of Cyrene. Mark gives us some details about Simon of Cyrene that the other gospel writers do not. Luke tells us about Simon carrying the cross for Jesus, but does not mention one detail Mark does, and that's the names of Simon's sons. Why in the world would the Lord see fit to have this detail recorded in the Bible? Why in the world would the Lord see fit to have the son's names of the man who carried the cross for Jesus? Why in the world would the Lord see fit to have their names recorded in such detail in the Bible? Alexander is not mentioned in the New Testament anywhere else. But his brother Rufus is mentioned in the church of Rome in the middle of the 50s. Most scholars are convinced that the reason Mark mentioned him in this text is that when Mark wrote his gospel, he wrote it to the Christians at Rome. And they would know about Rufus, Alexander, and their father, Simon of Cyrene. They would know Rufus himself, a member of the church, because he had been there when his dad carried the cross. Recently had the honor of uh, being there at a ceremony when they dedicated part of Highway uh, State Road 46 between Sanford and Geneva. Uh, they named it after my dad. And what an, uh, an honor it was to, to see that dedicated and to, to be able to point and say, you know, my, my dad served his community. But can you imagine being Rufus, the son of Simon, being able to tell your friends, my daddy carried Jesus. I was there and watched my daddy carry my Savior's cross. Oh, how our nation would be blessed and our churches would be blessed if we had more sons and daughters today who could testify, oh, I I saw my daddy take up his cross to follow his Savior. I saw my daddy love the Lord so much that he gave up his comforts and his conveniences to follow his Savior. So the Lord saw fit to have Mark record the name of the man who carried the cross of Jesus the names of his sons. And then we come to verse 22. Look there with me if you will please. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Wine mingled with myrrh was a narcotic given to executed prisoners to dull their senses a little bit to the pain they endured. One of the very few humane elements given to those executed by Rome. But Jesus did not take it. He suffered the full measure of the crucifixion without any painkillers. And there again in verse 22, uh, they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place 
of the skull. This is exactly what was prophesied in the Old Testament in Psalm 22. And then we read that it was the third hour which has Mark indicating that the crucifixion began at 9 o'clock in the morning because the time started counting at 6 a.m. The third hour would be 9 o'clock. The sixth hour would be noon. If your math is fine, you know that the ninth hour would be about 3 in the afternoon. And so Jesus' crucifixion started at 9 in the morning. Then look there, if you will, please, in verse 25. Now it was 9 in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge was written against him was the king of the Jews. They crucified two criminals with him, one on his right and one on his left. It was the custom of the Romans when they subjected someone to a public execution by crucifixion to nail up on the vertical beam of the cross the charges for which the prisoner was executed. In this case, the simple mes message was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. A heck of a thing to be crucified for, isn't it? Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And then he was hung on a cross between two thieves. And so the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And this happened according to the prophecy of Isaiah 53 in verse 12. Now look again, if you will, please, in verse 29. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha! The one who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself by coming down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest would describe were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. My friends, Jesus, mission was not to save himself. His purpose for coming was not to save himself. Jesus did not need a savior. He came to be our savior. Do you remember when the soldiers and such came to arrest Jesus and Peter drew his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant? Jesus said in Matthew 26, Put your sword back in its place because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot call on my Father and He will provide me here and now with more than twelve legions of angels? How then would the Scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jesus did not come to save Himself. He came so you and I might be saved. Some of you remember that old hymn from our childhood. He could have called ten thousand angels. To destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels. But he died alone. For you and me. Oh my friend. He who needed no savior. Came to be savior for those who could not save themselves. Now look there again if you will please in verse 31. In the same way, the chief priests would describe were marking, mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Can you imagine? These were supposed to be the religious leaders. These were supposed to be the ones who teach and demonstrate the love and the mercy of God to a lost and dying world. And they are laughing and mocking why a person dies in such terrible pain and torment. They saw the Christ. And they saw the King of Israel. And they saw the Savior. But as long as He was attached to that cross, they had no exercise of faith whatsoever. They essentially said, come on down, Jesus. Step down from the cross and maybe then we'll believe the claims that you have made. And even those who were crucified with Jesus taunted him. We know according to the other gospel accounts that one of them charged and one of them changed that taunting into faith 
before he died that day. But initially both of them were mocking Jesus. Then look, if you will, please, in verse 33. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. On April 8th, in parts of the world and parts of our country, there's going to be a total solar eclipse. And some have suggested that perhaps this was an eclipse. The longest solar eclipse of the 21st century took place on July 22nd, 2009, when, to when totality it lasted 6 minutes and 39 seconds. 6 minutes and 39 seconds. And yet the Bible records here that the earth was covered with darkness for 3 hours. My friends, this was not an eclipse. That darkness must have terrified the people there when God himself plunged the world into darkness. And there is significance to that. When Jesus took on the sin of the world, he became the most grotesque, obscene thing in human history. Because on him was placed the totality of the pollution of our wickedness. And God is too holy to even behold sin. So the Father turned the light sound on the Son, which was part of the curse for sin. And when that happened, Jesus screamed not at the agony of the thorns, the spears, the nails, or the cross, but at the forsakenness of God. God's own Son, who was with Him for, from eternity, willingly gave up His glory to become incarnate and enjoy the closest possible intimacy with the Father throughout his entire lifetime. He drank the cup of the Father's wrath and experienced forsakenness. And when it happened, he screamed, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The eyewitnesses were not only watching, but they were listening. And when they heard this anguished cry from Jesus, some said, He's calling for Elijah. Mark continues, Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. Elijah did not come. And nobody came until it was over. The spot on which this occurred traditionally was the place of Old Testament Mount Moriah where Abraham was commanded to sacrifice Isaac on the altar, which we read about in Genesis 22. When Abraham tied up his son and raised the knife to plunge it into his son's heart, at the last second, God called to him, Abraham, Abraham, lay not thy hand on thy son, for now I know that you trust me. Behold, Abraham looked up and he saw a ram with his horns caught in the thorns. And he went and took that substitute lamb and put it in the place of his son. And the son of Abraham was spared. But 2,000 years later on that same hill on a different altar, it was not Abraham's son, it was God's son. And this time, however, nobody yelled stop. So Mark records for us, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and he breathed his last. At that instant, the veil of the temple the veil that separated fallen humanity from the sacred holy of holies in the temple, the veil that many strands of woven material that could not be penetrated was suddenly torn from top to bottom. The veil would have been at least 30 foot high, and yet in an instant it was torn from top to bottom. There was nothing any longer separating man from God, for Jesus had paid the price, the wall of separation was ended 
The custom of the Romans was to have four soldiers guarding the prisoner during the execution headed by a fifth one who was a centurion, a leader over 100 soldiers. And Mark says that when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that, he cried out like this and breathed his last. The centurion was maybe the first to recognize something going on here beyond the local execution. For he said, truly this man was the Son of God. My friend Jesus, was scourged and he did that for you for by his wounds we all are healed do you love him today they cursed and mocked him he did that for you have you accepted him today the world turned dark because God turned his back on his son God made him who knew no sin to be sin for you and me. And on that cross was the vilest, most awful thing you can ever imagine. And the Lord had placed on him the iniquity of us all. And he did that for you. Do you serve him today? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of you have experienced loneliness. Some of you have experienced abandonment, but imagine the Son of God who's been with his Father through all eternity. The Son of God who's never known aloneness or separation from his Father. All of a sudden having the one that he was the closest to, that he loved the most, turn his back on him and abandon him because of all the sin of mankind that was placed on him. And there when he was in his greatest need and his greatest pain to cry out to a father who had turned his back on him, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? My friend, he did that for you. Do you obey him today? He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but it out alone for you and me. Let us pray. Father, there is no way that we can understand a love that would cause a father to allow to happen what you had happen to your son. A love for us so great that you had your son pay the price for us. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for second chances. Thank you for the opportunity to be saved. Thank you for the promise that this is not the end, that something more is coming. Lord, thank you for giving us the ability to have a relationship with you through the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.